Recently, I've been playing a lot of Crypt of the Necrodancer, and it got me thinking about how games choose to implement difficulty. There are a handful of characters in Crypt, each with their own unique style of gameplay. Items and stat upgrades are unlocked as you play, so the game tends to get easier over time. Finally, each level's pacing is dictated by the soundtrack, so increasing the tempo of a level's music means that you move faster, and so do all the monsters. These are just three of the ways that game designers can create challenge, and there are endless methods for bringing the right amount of difficulty to complement a game's mechanics. Although difficulty is sometimes an afterthought when considering the player experience, it tends to be a daunting matter. Recall that in our last long form, we discussed how randomness can have wide-reaching effects, so using it incorrectly can destroy even the best game design. In a similar way, difficulty is the key catalyst behind flow, the player state that every developer strives to deliver with their game. It's troubling that difficulty has such a large effect on the end product, because difficulty can be one of the toughest aspects of a game to manage. If you offer only a single level of challenge, the game must be balanced around that point, but you might discourage players whose skill is not within the bell curve. If you offer 2 or 5 or 100 levels of challenge, then the game must be balanced 2 or 5 or 100 different ways, and you've got to spend time adjusting your game to as many different skill levels as you choose. In this analysis, we'll take a look at difficulty as it pertains to the player experience. We'll first try to nail down a good definition of the concept, then explore some of the ways that it can be implemented in a game, regardless of genre. Finally, we'll get into the psychology of game difficulty, and what difficulty means as a silent conversation between developer and player. Because this is such a deep topic, we'll divide up this analysis into two separate videos. The first part will delve into setting up our framework and ideas for game difficulty. The second part will complete our framework and demonstrate practical applications. I think we already have a pretty good sense of what difficulty means in the context of a video game, but I want to set a broad definition here that we can use. The word difficulty itself actually means something not easily done, accomplished, or comprehended. But in gaming, it's often used to refer to the wide spectrum of all possible challenge options. That is, difficulty in gaming doesn't mean difficult. It means easy, normal, hard, or any variation within. It's best thought of a synonym of challenge. The difficulty of Cookie Clicker? Very easy. The difficulty of Dark Souls? Very challenging. With this definition, we can examine the relative difficulty options in a single game, or compare relative difficulties between two entirely different games. Difficulty is tough to balance, and frequently it's an afterthought in most game design. In other words, the levels and tasks are fleshed out before the nitty-gritty of how much damage this enemy does, or how much experience that monster gives. Difficulty can be as volatile as a bomb, because poor difficulty balance can easily destroy a beautiful game and undermine all of your hard work. If you're designing an RPG, you work on each area first, creating characters and cutscenes to explore a story. The actual numbers and mechanics can be tweaked once you've gotten the core gameplay down. But if 50% of all players' parties wipe in the game's first encounter, you're going to turn off a lot of potential players and stifle word-of-mouth promotion. In this way, you're appealing to a niche market, while your game's promotion appeals to a much larger one. Have you ever seen a film trailer that was strikingly dissimilar to the actual film? This is just one result of the dissonance that poor difficulty can create in a game. If the goal of any game is to resonate somehow within the player, then difficulty can be the fine-tuning or the hacksaw that can cripple that resonance. Most games actively work to induce flow, which is a tightrope walk between difficulty and player skill. We can consider these two aspects of game design to be metagame or emergent properties, meaning that they are born from interactions among basic gameplay concepts. Tetris isn't challenging simply because there are blocks. It's because there are many different block shapes, a limited field of play, and a timer that forces you to make moves quickly. A player that can manage all three is skilled enough to advance on to a more difficult stage, where the challenge is increased further to try and maintain flow. To induce flow, the player progression should be as close as possible to the progression in difficulty. And since a game designer can't change player skill, they're forced to change difficulty to reveal the exact nature of the skill and challenge relationship. If a slight bump in difficulty requires a disproportionate increase in player skill, the game is too hard and flow is interrupted. Instead of the smooth curve or step function that we want, we'll find that we have something that wavers outside of the desired boundaries. While all players will become more skilled over time, not all players will do so at the same rate. What's more is that the proportionality between these two concepts changes at a different rate for every game, perhaps even in different markets. As a designer, this means that you're trying to broadly induce flow by tinkering with individual game mechanics to improve the results in a cohesive system of mechanics. It's a bit like a mathematical function. The only way to tell what the output will be is to tweak the input a little bit 
run it through your system, and see what's popped out on the other side. We'll talk about this proportionality between challenge and skill shortly, but keep it in mind as the underlying goal when addressing game difficulty. There are a million and one ways to implement difficulty, and even more ways to balance it. We'll try to stick to the major methods that have persisted in the industry to showcase the big ideas. As far as I know, a widely accepted construct for game difficulty has yet to be created, so everything I'm putting forth here is my own personal way to organize game difficulty. That being said, the way we'll categorize here is not only subjective, but probably inefficient, so if you have any thoughts on a more effective way to examine difficulty, be sure to let us know. Our very first task should be to divide difficulty into two broad categories, of mechanical difficulty and conceptual difficulty. In each of these categories, we're now dealing with intended and unintended, as well as the many subsets of each. We'll see that most forms of difficulty can be grouped into one of these four categories, and while the differences between each type are fairly discrete, that line will begin to blur as we get into the details. Joe, the other half of Game Soup, made an excellent suggestion, so we'll further divide examples between rewarding and frustrating, and because any pseudo-academic discussion should try to remain objective, we'll adopt the term incremental for frustrating and decremental for rewarding to further describe our difficulty. Intended mechanical difficulty accounts for the vast majority of all instances of a challenge in a game. It's mechanical because the challenge is based in manipulating confined game mechanics accessible to the player. Broadly speaking, it often takes the form of anything you see on screen that responds to controller input. For example, something as simple as programming the movement in the very first Super Mario Bros. is a form of adjusting the game's intended mechanical difficulty. Have you ever noticed that Mario has both a speed up and a slow down period each time he walks or runs? It feels natural in this game, because it's been matched to the level design. But if you made Mario's acceleration only a fifth of what he normally has, it would take you that much longer to get to full running speed. Suddenly, large jumps are difficult because you didn't have the platform space from a dead stop. In fact, the trope of making an ice level where you slip and slide all over the ground is simply a manipulation of player acceleration and movement. At the other end of this extreme, we can set acceleration arbitrarily high, and Mario will instantly be at full speed when moving, and instantly stop without a gradual change in between. While this may feel more abrupt, it's the factor responsible for creating tight controls, and most of the time, we'd much prefer utilitarian controls to ultra-realistic controls. But most games aren't designed to incorporate this awkward abruptness, and as a result, they have varying levels of player acceleration, player speed, player density, gravity, and many other factors. And remember earlier when we said that poor difficulty balance can be the hacksaw that undermines the experience? Ice physics in a level designed with bottomless pits could prove to be a disaster for the average player by using intentional incremental difficulty. So it's important to balance player animations and movement around the desired challenge. How about Super Mario Bros. 2? Luigi had a much floatier jump than Mario, and the added benefit of being able to cross long gaps and correct your trajectory when the platforming gets tricky. A change as simple as adjusting the game's gravity can massively decrement the mechanical challenge of the platforming, giving you more time to react. This exemplifies the unique character gameplay styles that we mentioned above regarding Crypt of the Necrodancer, and this method is an industry staple in many RPGs and action games. Modifying game physics is the basis for most 2D fighting titles. In Smash Bros., it's what makes Bowser a big slow fighter, but Pit a fast floaty one. Consider the difficulty of Flappy Bird. The real fight here is actually against the gravity that's programmed into the game, which is nothing more than a single value that can be easily tweaked by a developer. Of course, gravity is usually just another form of acceleration, just in the up and down directions. If the blocks in Angry Birds had the density of a black hole, you'd have a real tough time trying to knock them down by shooting an animal out of a cannon. This all ties back to how individual characters are programmed to mimic reality, at least in part. We notice if acceleration is way off, and we notice if our character stops instantly from a full run. Player movement itself can lead to unique implementations of difficulty. Even a very narrow platform would pose no challenge to a character with no acceleration period, but it could be a tear your hair out challenge if the character was designed to slip and slide all the time. If movement is designed after the levels, then the movement can be easily adjusted and fine-tuned without having to change the core design of your game. In truth, games of all genres rely on intended mechanical difficulty to provide challenge. Guitar Hero and Rock Band can both be difficult games that operate on a singular gameplay element. It's not hard to hold a button with one hand and strum with the other, but it's undeniably hard to do this hundreds or thousands of times in just a few minutes at varying speeds and rhythms, while you can only sight-read a few notes into the future. Challenge also comes from player animations. Performing a jump attack in Dark Souls locks your character in the attack animation, and during this time, you can't move or cancel the attack in any way. 
This means you've got to think carefully about when to use this attack, because even though it's powerful, you're exposing yourself to danger due to the very long animation lock. Heavier weapons tend to be more powerful as well, but you're leaving yourself open for a long period of time as a result. This mechanical difficulty makes up a core component of the game, dictating the flow of combat when a single strike could mean failure. A similar animation lock occurs in Castlevania for the NES. Once you jump, your left-right momentum is conserved and you have no control whatsoever over your character for the duration of the jump. Furthermore, any damage you take locks your character in a knockback animation. This can make platforming a nightmare, even though it is technically accurate physics. Most games do allow your character some movement in the air because even though it's less accurate, it usually makes the game feel more fair. In other words, it lowers the challenge very slightly because you can correct yourself in midair, but because of the change, we can now up the ante on our game's platforming and expect more out of the player in turn. As silly as it sounds, this makes for a better jumping experience than when your animation is locked. So challenge can occur via the duration of animations or the options not accessible to the player in certain situations. Invincibility frames after taking damage mechanically adjust the difficulty by preventing repeated unavoidable damage. Anytime you play Street Fighter and miss your opponent with a heavy attack, you're leaving yourself open for the duration of your character's animation. But even if you get hit, your invincibility frames might keep you alive. Showing the player that strength has a trade-off in the form of time does a great job of reinforcing specific player behaviors, because taking control away from a player leaves them helpless and vulnerable for the duration. This is sometimes used as a cheap way to include artificial difficulty in games. Artificial difficulty can occur in any of our four major categories, such as mechanically intended stun locking. Our Castlevania example above shows artificial difficulty because of the player physics clashing with the level design. In a real-time game, taking control away from the player for even a second can mean the difference between life and death. And because this death wasn't based on the player's skill in real time, it has the potential to feel cheap. The game is reminding you that you need to play by its rules, but if the words unfair death come to mind, then there was probably a better way for the developers to give you this reminder. When a game's difficulty is at least partially situational, then difficulty as a whole can be adjusted without making any major changes to enemy or player behavior. This is the logic behind checkpoint systems. The current challenge level is probably only temporary, so saving time getting the player back to that section helps reduce the difficulty. Compare this with forcing the player to start from the beginning of the level every time he or she dies. To achieve this goal, Resident Evil 4 features automatic enemy density adjustments, depending on the number of times a player has died in an area. The more recent Mario titles allow you to bypass difficult sections of a level if you lose a certain number of lives. These intended mechanical techniques greatly increase the skill range of your player base. If you can handle two enemies at once but not four, then simply reducing the number of simultaneous threats can achieve the same goal as playing with numbers on the back end. Why balance an alternative set of statistics to make a zombie's attack deal 50% damage, when instead, you could just cut the number of zombies by 50%? The latter, if not objectively better, is definitely more time efficient, and for complex games with a lot of numbers, time is something that developers don't really have a lot of. There are also many genre-specific tricks to adjusting a game's base challenge. If your character in XCOM only has a 60% chance to hit with his gun, then perhaps lowering the difficulty would adjust the randomness to increase the odds of a successful shot. Games with roguelike elements sometimes forgo difficulty toggling and instead provide long-term upgrades that carry over to each restart, like Rogue Legacy. If your 2D platformer has certain levels that feature an automatically scrolling camera, then the speed of that scrolling camera is a form of difficulty itself, and it's independent of enemy AI or player animation. The faster the scroll, the harder the level is to complete. RPGs frequently use a leveling system that's just a numbers game, and if you overlevel your characters, the game will become easy. But if an RPG nearly requires the player to grind for hours between each story arc, it's prolonging the game experience by inflating difficulty. Since the leveling mechanic is built into both playable characters and enemies, Developers are free to adjust enemy difficulty by changing their strength, speed, defense, or any other property. The player's skill during random battle would ideally be the most important factor in victory, but even the most skilled player can't win against a boss that's 90 levels higher than they are. I'm not implying the developers who do this are lazy by any means. They've chosen this method to implement difficulty, and whether it's a good or bad choice depends solely on the context of the individual game. Unintended mechanical difficulty can sometimes show itself through unbalanced abilities, these might warrant a buff or a nerf. Whenever the complexity of game mechanics leads to unintended behavior, there is the potential for exploiting imbalances, which necessitates increasing or decreasing player abilities when games are symmetrically competitive, like StarCraft or Halo. Wherever you see a buff or a nerf, you can be fairly certain that there was once an unintended mechanical difficulty, whether incremental or decremental, 
related to that skill or ability. Hearthstone occasionally nerfs and buffs certain cards, because the unpredictable metagame is constantly promoting unique deck combinations that may upset the balance of power between the game's nine classes. The other, and much more prevalent arm of unintended mechanical difficulty is mostly within the realm of the hardware, both in technological limitations and in programming errors. Have you ever had to fight a game's camera and lost? Many games in the early years of 3D had notably contrarian camera systems, which ideally shouldn't ever cause the player to lose. But because the camera is now an additional element to fine-tune, the developer's vision must account for its behavior in all cases. Falling into a bottomless pit because the camera suddenly swivels 360 degrees looks bad and feels worse, and no developer intends for this to happen. Technical limitations that affect difficulty might be things like pop-up, unclear orientation, or low draw distance. If Skyrim only had a draw distance of 3 feet, it would be a lot harder to avoid enemy attacks. Or if quest items popped in only when you got within 5 feet of them, you could spend hours searching an area for an item you've already walked past 4 times. Sure, these limitations are an annoyance, but they tend to maintain the integrity of the game experience, which is in stark contrast with our next point. Bugs and glitches, which I consider to be the most virulent strain of programming error. Unlike our technological limitation examples, bugs and glitches arise from human error. For example, in Mario RPG, you can skip a major early boss fight by jumping over the trigger for it. Exploits like this that give advantages to a player artificially increase player skill, relative to the current challenge level, which means a temporary decrease in difficulty. Most RPGs are built to resist this form of leveling up. It doesn't make sense to bypass a fight if you're going to be underleveled later as a result. Any game with a reproducible mechanical bug has the potential for its difficulty to be unintentionally altered. Every game, whether a weekend project or a AAA masterpiece, will have bugs and glitches. Sometimes they can totally break the game experience and make it unbeatable. Bubble Bobble Revolution for the DS had 100 levels, but the boss of level 30 didn't spawn, meaning that anyone who bought a copy was stuck at that point. Other times, Bugs and glitches allow you to skip whole chunks of a game and get a faster completion time, making those games popular for speedrunning. In Super Mario 64, you can start a new file, fight Bowser, and see the end credits in under 10 minutes, if you use a glitch called the backwards long jump glitch. Many Metroidvania titles are speedrun favorites because of sequence breaking, using glitches to bypass the intended player progression, leading to incredibly fast completion. To relate all this back to Crypt of the Necrodancer, we can see that there are still difficulty methods that have yet to be fully explored. Easy, medium, and hard mode are replaced with a static level difficulty, but dynamic character difficulty. Playing as a different character is the main way the player chooses a difficulty setting. But what about increasing the tempo of level's music? If the gameplay is directly tied to that tempo, then making the music faster would make the gameplay harder, even if the dungeon layout and the enemies remain the same. Like a scrolling camera, this increases difficulty by requiring faster player input. It doesn't matter how much you plan or strategize beforehand, the game is hard because you think on your feet at 160 beats per minute, and learning to quickly assess your surroundings with so little time to plan beforehand makes it a difficult but addicting experience. As a result, most player deaths are the fault of the player. Cheap and unfair deaths in this game are rare. Enemies feature no random pathing or random attacks, so you're never rolling dice to know if you're about to die. A skeleton that's two steps away from you will always jump one space towards you if possible, and if it kills you, it's because you moved into a converging tile. We're getting into the topic of fairness here, so to stay on track, we'll save the majority of that discussion for later on. We've now covered our first major category, mechanical difficulty. The other fork, conceptual difficulty, will have to wait until part two. In the meantime, we thank you for your ongoing support of GameSoup. Welcome to part two of our long-form analysis on video game difficulty. Recall that in part one, we explored how mechanical difficulty, which comes in two flavors, is intertwined with player and world physics, controller input, and animations. The right amount of difficulty is key to producing player flow, so it pays to balance your game meticulously. We've now covered our first major category, mechanical difficulty. The other fork, conceptual difficulty, is certainly more subjective. Conceptual difficulty isn't related to controller inputs or character animations, which can sometimes make it harder for the player to know whether a game is punishing them. This variety of difficulty often pops up when you're thinking hard about your progression in a game. You might be analyzing an enemy's movement patterns, devising a flanking strategy on a battlefield, or simply juggling obstacles while waiting for a moment to press your advantage. A roguelike with turn-based tile movement is a great example of conceptual difficulty. It's not your player's physics that must be mastered, but rather your own assessments and improvisation in unique situations. In other words, mechanical difficulty involves your hands and reflexes, but conceptual difficulty involves your brain and logic skills. Like mechanical difficulty, conceptual difficulty can also be applied either intentionally or unintentionally, 
But because feedback on conceptual difficulty is not always immediate like mechanical difficulty is, it can be harder for players to develop skill. Conceptual difficulty often takes the form of resource management, especially in turn-based or strategy games. A basic principle of economics called opportunity cost often lends precision to game difficulty. Opportunity cost essentially means that if you are presented with two or more options, but can only have one, then the options you didn't choose are lost as potential assets. For example, you might emphasize character defense over skill damage, in which case your character isn't as strong as possible, but you might survive longer. Making a deck consisting of just 30 cards in Hearthstone, which currently has over 600 different cards available, means giving up the benefits of many other cards you won't have room for. Conceptual difficulty is also commonly used as a barrier for secrets and bonus content that the average player may not even discover. It may be due to what is sometimes called game world logic, which will necessarily deviate from reality's logic. Beat Dark Souls 2 without saving or dying and you'll unlock a new ring, and because this makes no sense in reality, it ends up being a secret of the game's world acting on the game's logic. Denial of information regarding a game world is an easy way to reward the most dedicated players, but you run the risk of alienating everyone else. Developers can therefore choose whether to drop hints to the player to adjust the chances that a player will discover such secrets. Before we take a step down this road, I want to remind you that these are merely examples of difficulty modification, not critiques of the games, franchises, or companies themselves. In fact, we're going to start with three of my all-time favorites. Final Fantasy IX's Excalibur II weapon and Final Fantasy XII's Zodiac Spear are perhaps the most egregious examples in modifying difficulty via game logic. In particular, this kind of modification is the denial of information we mentioned above, and in these cases it's taken to its extreme. For Final Fantasy IX, you had to rush through the game and reach the final dungeon within 12 hours of playtime. The biggest offense here is that there's not a shred of information in the game that hints at this, so on a first playthrough, Roughly 99.99% .99 of all players will miss the chance to get this weapon. But this is a game that nearly demands taking the scenic route. It rewards careful planning as you teach your character certain abilities. It encourages inspecting equipment to find the best combination for each of your fighters, and pacing yourself throughout the game with a ton of optional content and side quests. In short, the game's values clash directly with the steps required to obtain the ultimate weapon. You know, this sounds like the perfect kind of secret for a strategy guide. Maybe we should get Brady Games to write a companion book. In fact, the more obscure the secrets are, the more likely our fans will buy a strategy guide to go with our game. Hey, Final Fantasy XII, I have a great idea for one of your weapons. Now, hold on a sec. Let's look at Final Fantasy X here. Let's see. We can require the player to complete a chocobo race with a score of less than zero seconds in order to get the main character's ultimate weapon. If the player can dodge, let's say, 200 lightning bolts in a row, we'll give them the Black Mage ultimate weapon. And we better not give any hints uh, or imply in any way that the player should attempt these. What do you think the odds are of a player figuring either of these out on their own? What, 0% you say? Perfect. Call up Brady Games, will ya? Final Fantasy XII has hundreds and hundreds of treasure chests strewn throughout its levels. And there are exactly four that you must never, under any circumstances, open. The reward for not opening these four specific treasure chests? Arguably the most powerful weapon in the game, the Zodiac Spear. The problem here is information withholding. The four evil chests are in four completely different areas of the game, and one is even hiding among 15 other identical chests on a sandy shore. So which four chests should we forbid the player to open if they want to get this incredibly rare item? Are we going to drop hints in the game, or explain how the player's natural instinct to open treasure chests will sabotage a separate treasure chest that's miles or hours away? Maybe it's quantum entanglement, I don't know. But I have a better idea. Let's not mention it anywhere in the game, Never explain that it's these four chests specifically, and let only the most determined players find it. Oh, and do me a favor. Call up Brady Games, will ya? Okay, we get the idea now, but the offenses here straddle the fine line between encouraging exploration and overwhelming the player and sending them to the internet for help. If the anxiety of missing out on game secrets is too high because of a high degree of information denial, then looking up a walkthrough on GameFAQs provides a superior experience. Luckily, these examples are for ultimate weapons, so it's perfectly possible, and indeed, expected, that most players will complete these games without obtaining all of them, without outside help. But this doesn't change the fact that these are examples of denial of information, artificially modifying a game's natural challenge to include factors that are essentially impossible for a player to know about. But if that same player picks up the strategy guide, they're getting real value out of learning the game's secrets. If any developer can make its game's secrets this obtuse in order to sell copies of an official strategy guide, we're looking at intentional conceptual difficulty. But since it's just as easy and also free to use an online walkthrough, we're going to have trouble selling the strategy guide.
And if this book doesn't sell well, well, what's the point of making these esoteric secrets anyway? Denial of information on the same scale as those above is never rewarding because it has to be told, not shown, to the player. Would you spend two hours racing chocobos in Final Fantasy X if there were no reward? Would you spend an entire day dodging lightning bolts just for the sheer challenge? The hard copy strategy guide market has mostly fallen by the wayside, and whether that's a good or bad thing is up to you. I remember quite fondly flipping through beautifully detailed concept art while reading up on how to become better in certain dungeons or battles. And as long as a game is not designed with a companion guide in mind during development, this type of intended conceptual difficulty is typically a great additional layer of complexity to a game's world. Mist for PC was once the best-selling PC game of all time, but it didn't feature flashy action sequences or non-linear storytelling. Instead, like many point-and-click adventures, it relied on intentional conceptual difficulty. The game is challenging not because it requires fast reflexes, but because it requires careful, logical, and sometimes illogical, thinking. Point-and-clicks have used this technique for decades, and here we'll borrow TV Tropes terminology and call this moon logic. This is more or less when a game expects you to create a Rube Goldberg type contraption, using items in your inventory, and often the right answer is found by brute forcing, rather than logical thinking. For example, you're stuck in a jail cell and you have to escape. So let's combine a bottle of water with a deck of cards to make card mush, which is of course flammable when dry. We have to dry the card mush by combining it with a handheld vacuum, because we want to suck all the moisture out of it. Finally, we need to start a fire by, hmm, taking an origami crane and placing it through the jail cell bars. A guard will come by to pick it up and will fail to notice that he's dropped his lighter. Now you can light the card mush on fire to blast open the cell's door and escape. I've never played Grim Fandango, but there is a slight variation on intended conceptual difficulty in the following example. You're stopped from progressing by a bouncer, and you must prove that you know a certain mob boss by answering a series of number-based questions about him. You know none of these things, but you will inexplicably succeed if you answer with the number that just won on the roulette table behind you. This is clearly intentional, but the level of conceptual difficulty here is astronomically high, almost comically so. Can you imagine the frustration a player might feel six or seven hours into a great point-and-click adventure, only to be stopped by a seemingly inconsequential puzzle with no hints available? No matter the genre of the game, inspiring a player to seek out a walkthrough online so that they can better understand your mechanics is a good sign of your game's depth. Forcing your player to consult a walkthrough online because a person of average intelligence wouldn't connect unrelated dots is a bad sign that you're relying on artificial difficulty. Conceptual difficulty makes up essentially 100% of the Professor Layton series, as well as most free-paced puzzle games. You're still using the game's mechanical operation as a framework for puzzles, but the challenge isn't tied to the way that characters are animated or the height of your jump. Tetris and Dr. Mario do have a mechanical component, the time limit for each falling block but each puzzle in Professor Layton is an independent, wholly conceptual event. A game that breaks the fourth wall necessarily invalidates part of its own game logic, like fighting Psycho Mantis in Metal Gear Solid. Switching your controller to the console's second port is a clever and memorable trick, but almost nobody would think to do it in the heat of a boss battle. In fact, the game literally has to tell you that this is the correct solution, because it's so unintuitive. In other words, this is an intentional, incremental, conceptual difficulty, so detrimental to player flow that the developers solve it for you. What we're left with is a really, really neat trick and a short-lived difficulty spike. Unintentional conceptual difficulty is by far the most elusive type of difficulty. My go-to example is when there's a miscommunication between developer and player, disrupting game flow by some unexpected circumstance. We saw that intentional conceptual difficulty can sometimes resort to breaking the logic of the game world, and unintentional conceptual difficulty frequently happens in the same places if mechanics aren't easily grasped, or when negative player feedback is greater than anticipated. Before we dive back into it, we can take another quick example from Professor Layton here. Whenever you encounter a puzzle, you're taken to a puzzle screen separate from the game's environment, which informs the player that this puzzle is a self-contained event. Watch how this expectation is subverted. In one puzzle, you need to use two corks to plug up two bottles filled with garlic. You can stare at this maze of tubes all day long and never come up with a satisfactory answer. When you finally get frustrated at this puzzle, you might turn off the game, take a break, or give up entirely. But if you're lucky and tenacious, you might discover that the real solution to this puzzle is to use the corks to plug this man's nose. Does that feel like a cheap solution to you? It certainly does to me. There's a little bit of information denial at work here, subverting player expectations. If there are 300 puzzles and all but two or three actually respect the puzzle's conceptual boundaries, then those two or three violations will rarely feel satisfying. You might concede that, yes, I suppose the solution is quite logical, but it's not satisfying to come up against a puzzle like this only to feel cheated when the puzzle itself is merely a distraction. 
Exploiting game world logic with sleight of hand is a surefire way to disrupt game flow. Now we'll talk about game systems that can aggravate unintentional conceptual difficulty. Final Fantasy VIII uses a unique junction system for its magic. You no longer learn spells based on a class, and your casts are limited to the units of a particular magic spell that you have in your inventory. When I first played the game, I didn't understand the complexities of this system until many hours into the game, and the finer details still elude me. The danger here lies in the player potentially deciding that learning this system isn't worth his time, and instead he'll go through the entire game without it or put the game down entirely. One might be tempted to call this intentional mechanical difficulty, but because the junction system isn't tailored to providing a specific level of challenge, I'm not sure that it qualifies. Rather, junctioning requires the player to think and consider how they want their battle party to be equipped. It's never a developer's intention to provide a game system so complex that the player is turned off by it, but I think this junction system has the potential to unintentionally discourage players from engaging in the game. Regardless of the player's experience with RPGs, many are likely to be confused about how junctioning works the first time because there's no other system like it. But a minor tweak to the magic system, like in most other RPGs, still provides an anchor for players, so they only need to take a small mental leap to fully understand those magic systems. Conceptually, junctioning can unintentionally degrade the player's experience. Again, it's not the performance of the system itself that causes difficulty, but rather understanding it conceptually. Now, I'm probably in the minority for not understanding junctioning, but I'm pretty sure that every gamer out there can relate. So what might be the effect of this junction system on player flow? The game is balanced around the expectation that a player will use the junction system to the best of his or her ability. When the player loses this advantage, the game difficulty begins to outweigh the player's skill. It's interesting that, to fully enjoy this game, the player must first acquire a new skill, junctioning magic, which makes the beginning of the game potentially more difficult for players unfamiliar with the system. Silent Hill is a series well known for both its atmosphere and gameplay. The series also employs highly challenging puzzles, some of which require knowledge of outside information. Note how this is different than denial of information, in that it's information outside the game world that's missing, not rules and logic about the game itself. One puzzle in Silent Hill 3 requires the player to have knowledge of several different Shakespeare works. For example, the game gives the hint, one vengeful man spilled blood for two. And the correct response to this clue requires knowing that this describes Hamlet, and since Hamlet belongs to Anthology 4 in the game, this value has to be multiplied by 2 to get 8. Granted, this is the puzzle on hard mode. Normal and easy provide significantly less challenge here. But remember that we're focusing on unintentional conceptual difficulty. It is impossible for the developers to quantify the Shakespeare knowledge of consumers, especially in a different market region. This makes the puzzle a shot in the dark as far as what percentage of people will correctly solve it. The translation from Japanese to English fundamentally changes the meaning of the puzzle's hints. So whatever the intended challenge of the puzzle was in Japan, it's most likely skewed upward or downward in North America. You might consider this to be intentional conceptual difficulty, and that's not wrong. I consider it both intentional and unintentional, because the original challenge of this puzzle is modified based on cultural differences and language barriers. The pieces of the puzzle remain the same, but the information given to the player is necessarily different. In fact, any translation from Japanese can affect the success rate of the player and sometimes vital clues are actually lost in translation. The original Legend of Zelda for the NES is infamous for its often baffling translations. In the Japanese version, one NPC tells you, search for the Lion Key. This gives the player a lot of information. It gives them a clear goal, finding the key, it tells them that the key will allow them to open up another part of the game, and they know that the key itself is probably somewhere in a dungeon or on the overworld. But the US version of this NPC has a completely different line, Tenth Enemy has the bomb. This doesn't tell us much of anything, which is why it's generally useless advice for most players. The use of the definite article the here hints at some greater importance than the indefinite a, and this hint fails to mention that you must kill 10 enemies in a row without taking damage. And of course, the player has no clue about the existence of any lion key. Another misleading translation occurs with this enemy, when you're given the hint that it hates loud noises. This hint is for Japanese players only to use the built-in microphone on the second Famicom controller, which instantly destroys all on-screen enemies of this type. But since no such microphone controller existed in Western markets, this hint only served to unintentionally confuse players. The game is therefore more difficult for the average Western player because they have access to fewer tools to achieve the same tasks, namely killing this enemy. Luckily, this is a pretty inconsequential enemy, but the same sort of mistranslation for a more important enemy or plot detail 
could have been exponentially worse. Muscle memory itself can be considered unintentional conceptual difficulty. A player who has learned that B is run and A is jump would have significantly more difficulty with a game that switches this up than a player who never had this information burned into his muscles in the first place. A psychologist would refer to this as negative transfer because learning is hindered by one's previous knowledge, like when you try to switch from a manual transmission to an automatic. While most games tend to adopt standard controller configurations, reversing the function of the circle and X buttons on a PlayStation controller could cause a lot of frustration during gameplay. A developer can't control the player's past experiences, so it's nearly impossible to put all consumers on a level playing field. Someone who recently switched from an SNES to an Xbox One would have a really tough time with on-screen directions. The extra second it takes to look down at the controller to verify can cause failure where others may succeed. When possible, giving the player his choice of challenge level is a perfectly adequate solution for conceptual difficulty. The Silent Hill series is fairly unusual in that it lets you choose difficulties for combat and puzzles separately so that a player skilled in combat won't hit a roadblock on a hard puzzle and quit playing the game. System Shock also featured difficulty settings for four different aspects of the core gameplay. And Bravely Default for the 3DS lets you choose both the battle frequency and rewards. These options allow the player to experience the story at a pace not dependent on combat skills. All the changes we've mentioned here are indicative of the growth of video games as a narrative medium. As video gaming becomes more and more commonplace within society, it pays for developers to consider that some players want to experience a game's story without the potential frustration of gameplay. The connection between a player's skill and a player's success in a game's narrative has become more and more tenuous as games grow in technical complexity. All of this is to say that there's really only one goal in mind when adjusting difficulty, keeping the player in flow, and by extension, keeping an even pace between the level of challenge and player skill. When we talk about a game's difficulty curve, what we're really talking about here is the game's ability to induce flow over time. An easy game tends to produce too little challenge relative to skill, and a very hard game produces too much challenge relative to skill. But let's look at the big picture here and try to apply the concept of flow over the course of an entire game. All forms of media can adopt certain structures to help tell a story, and gaming is no exception. The last research paper you wrote in school probably needed an introduction, body, and conclusion. Where a film might use a three-act structure with rising and falling action, a video game structure might resemble a step function. As the challenge, the independent variable, increases over time, the player's skill level must increase accordingly, or else the player can't advance. This is probably a large part of what makes games so fun to play. You very quickly gain mastery over new skills, and you can continue to refine them. This balance between challenge and skill usually goes by the name of flow, which makes video games unlike most other forms of media. As long as you're inducing flow, you're probably on the right track to making a satisfying game. Flow is the structure of video games. It functions independently of plot or gameplay. If you've ever heard someone refer to a game as more than the sum of its parts, there's probably well-managed flow making up the difference. So if our four types of difficulty make up the difficulty curve, and the difficulty curve in turn regulates flow, then the most elemental forms of difficulty produce nearly all of the satisfaction derived during gameplay. Mismanagement of flow causes predictable results. What happens if your abilities outpace a game's challenge? The game is easy at best, and at worst, it's boring. If a game's challenge outweighs the player's skills, the game is at best too hard, and at worst, hair-tearingly or controller-smashingly frustrating. Have you ever reached a brick wall point in a game that seems disproportionately difficult based on the game so far? Perhaps it's a required boss fight in a Metroidvania, or an RPG boss that is so hard at first glance that you were sure you were supposed to lose. Then the game goes back to the title screen and your jaw drops because you just realize how much time you need to sink in to progress any farther. The Metroid-style Castlevania games for Game Boy Advance and DS often featured only a very mild increase in difficulty between bosses, while the bosses themselves may have represented a steep increase on a difficulty curve. This easy level, hard boss trope is just one of many common approaches for flow management, and it's also prevalent in the Ease and Dark Souls games. What's more is that flow deviation can occur almost any time and varies highly from player to player. This is the logic in Mario Kart's rubber banding AI. It allows for players of all skill levels to experience the same level of difficulty. It's also the reasoning behind Resident Evil 4's enemy density adjustments, and Oblivion's enemies always leveling at the same rate as the player. In essence, these games are collecting feedback from you, the player, to try and deliver a suitable difficulty from a static template. You'll probably spend a lot of time and money during game development if you want to provide dynamic difficulty in your game, so whether it's worth it or not to you to pursue this strategy is not always clear. By now, I think we can agree that difficulty doesn't operate in a vacuum, and it frequently blends with overall balance by affecting most mechanics on a foundational level. 
As the capstone to this discussion, let's analyze two existing titles for difficulty implementation and see if we can identify what types of challenge we're dealing with. Doom 2 is still one of my favorite games because of its fantastic level designs and skillful combat, and it features five different difficulty settings. Rather than telling the player explicitly what's changed between each difficulty setting, the game intentionally obscures this information in its iconic difficulty descriptions. In addition, all the stuff inside each level is affected by this setting, so keys needed to complete each level may have different locations, affecting conceptual difficulty if the key becomes harder to find. Both enemy numbers and behavior have three unique settings, and the highest difficulty adds respawning monsters with increased animation speeds. Each level has numerous secrets that often require a sharp eye for misplaced or unusual textures, and as levels grow in size over the course of the game, you'll often find that the conceptual difficulty spikes as you search out both keys and their respective colored doors. But the game's conceptual difficulty is sound. Get to the exit whether you've killed enemies or not. You're never unsure of what your goal is, merely how to achieve it. If I had to point to an unintentional conceptual difficulty in this case, I'm sometimes confused if I hit a switch, but don't notice any immediate change in my environment. I think that this is a way to hint to the player that the affected door or platform is far away from the switch, but I sometimes find myself questioning whether I hit the switch, and maybe I should go hunting for a change, or maybe I accidentally hit it twice and subsequently deactivated it. Some switches automatically turn off after a short delay, and without doing some research on the game's puzzles, the varying behavior of switches and buttons can be confusing to a new player. The many different approaches to challenge here are a good representation of difficulty snowballing. Notice that on the hardest difficulty, all these separate factors synergize with each other. If you have conditions X, Y, and Z, then the difficulty that's put out might not be directly proportional. It depends on how each factor behaves in the presence of all the others. Doom 2 mixes both major types of difficulty to provide a challenge that is more than the sum of its parts. I played FTL for the first time last year and was addicted to the game's challenge for quite a while. It bears no resemblance to Doom 2, but various difficulty methods will overlap between these two. We'll start with the mechanics. Just as shooting a rocket in Doom 2 subtracts one rocket from your available stockpile, making a single faster than light jump in FTL subtracts one from your fuel stockpile. Get your health or hull integrity down to zero and the game ends. But FTL has a much slower pace. You can pause the game at any time to assign a limited supply of power to different parts of your ship. All locations in FTL involve an event that's randomly generated from a large pool of possible scenarios, and since this means the game is never the same experience, it's substantially more difficult to survive without quick and critical thinking. Unlike Doom 2, FTL features the traditional easy, normal, hard system for difficulty, and the differences between the three are made explicit to the player. Despite the completely different style of gameplay, the changes are similar to Doom 2. Pickups are more plentiful on easy, enemies are harder to take down on hard. FTL features many more layers of mechanical complexity. You can choose from one of about 30 different ship layouts, each with a combination of 8 different playable races, the weapons you come across are randomly generated, and the chance to hit or evade is a huge factor in battle. So where Doom 2 uses essentially no randomness, FTL relies on it, and also piles on a few more layers of player choice. Have you ever played a game that made you simply stop and think for an extended period, perhaps when you had to choose one option out of several choices? I've literally stared at my screen for minutes, thinking about all the possible outcomes when I'm deciding which weapon to buy, which kinds of crew members to use, or which airlocks to keep closed. This goes back to our opportunity cost when making decisions, and FTL really shines with its conceptual difficulty. Every decision you make can come back to bite you later, or carry you through to victory. And it's impossible to tell how a single event will affect your playthrough because all events are random. You might lose half your crew and 75% of your hull integrity after three battles, but end up with a full party of eight and insanely powerful weapons five minutes later. Because you're never sure what's next, repeated playthroughs will slowly fill out your knowledge of what's possible. This, in turn, encourages careful thinking and resource management, with priorities that change over the course of the game. You can't power a section of your ship without sacrificing utility in another area, but you can spend some currency to get more power units. But if you do this, you might not be able to afford a weapon, if you happen to come across a shop in the next three or four jumps. There are a lot of ifs here, and I think that's part of this game's intentional conceptual difficulty. The player doesn't know the chances of any particular event happening at a location. If there's a 95% chance that a battle will occur at any location, you might decide to backtrack to a repair shop. But if there's only a 20% chance of battle, then you might want to risk it to get to a shop a little bit farther ahead. Given your limited fuel source, this makes every single decision a heavy one. You can always reload a save in Doom 2 and go for a Hail Mary, but in FTL there are no second chances. 
Now throw in all those other mechanics we've mentioned, and you've got a highly complex game whose difficulty is just as variable, regardless of the actual difficulty setting you've chosen. Because of its random nature, not every game is winnable, but each failed run teaches you something more about FTL's game logic, so that your next run is more likely to succeed. I hope it's apparent that these two games balance difficulty in similar ways, and equally apparent is how they still manage to emphasize two completely different player behaviors. Both games do more than just play the numbers game when you choose a difficulty setting, and the resulting cascade of changes fine-tunes whichever setting you choose. As always, the key is producing and maintaining flow, and if there is one thing that this comparison should tell you, it's that developers can mix any of the four major types of difficulty in whatever proportions will fit their vision. This tentative framework for difficulty is immature, and while it has so far accommodated every example of difficulty I've come across, it's not necessarily the best model. Our four major categories of difficulty all affect flow in their own unique way, and like difficulty, inducing flow is always a balancing act emerging from four distinct approaches to providing challenge. The problem with trying to objectively describe everything that goes into making a game challenging is akin to explaining all the parts of a car when they're in a pile on the ground. They just don't do much of anything. But when in the correct configuration, different units of difficulty add up to an emergent difficulty, mostly untethered to any one factor. Each difficulty factor in isolation has its own properties, but together all factors synergize unpredictably. I hope that this analysis has given you a little bit of insight in making game difficulty work for you. And if you're currently trying to balance your game's difficulty, feel free to adjust the relative strength of enemies, the relative strength of your player, the health of your player, the strength of items and power-ups, frequency of items or power-ups, the frequency of enemies or enemy types, the complexity of the enemy AI, the player's movement speed, jump strength, acceleration, gravity or density, the animation speeds, the time limit, the time scale, puzzle complexity, game world logic. Finally, if you're still with me after all that, a little bit of luck can't hurt.